Yo, what's good? Welcome back to Cybermen Reacts, where today we are reacting to 10 real life murder plot twists. And you have myself, Ethan, and Vic. But what if it's not Vic? What if it's an imposter? Is that a plot twist? Is Ethan still alive? <laughs> <laughs> no, there has been a murder. Is Ethan a victim of himself? Hello, there has been a murder. <laughs> yeah, there has been a murder. Alright, yeah, no, buzzing for this. Real life <laughs> murder plot twist. Yeah, no quality. I'm ready to see some stuff. Alright, press play, bro. Alright, okay, man. 10 real life murder plot twists. Number 10. The Drag Queen's Trunk. Get ready for this one, this story is insane. Bobby Worley, a man from North Carolina, spent most of his life in and out of jail. In 1963, after he'd spent three years in Sing Sing Prison, cool prison name. he was released and decided to change his name to Bobby Wells. He moved in with one of his brothers in the Bronx, where in 1968, he got into an argument with a neighbor. When the woman threatened to call the police, Bobby decided to cut and run. The problem was he disappeared, his family never heard from him again. 25 years passed. Suddenly, in 1993, Bobby was linked to Dorian Corey, a famous drag queen of the 1960s. Corey had died, and when cleaning out her Manhattan apartment, her friends discovered a large trunk containing a partially mummified body. A fingerprint uh, check identified this body as Bobby Worley. Oh. The police determined Wells died from a gunshot to the back of the head about 15 years before, but who pulled oh. the trigger remains open to speculation. That is mental. That's nuts. Well, that was the plot twist. The guy just died. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, there wasn't really a plot twist. Uh, I mean, it's interesting, but what, um, where's the plot twist? Number 9. Postcards, Pools and Fake Rockefellers in 1985, John and Linda Sohus went on a two-week trip to New York. Two months later, they were nice. reported missing. At oh. that time, the Sohus had moved into John's mum's house in San Marino, California. The woman was also renting the property's guest house to Christopher Chichester. According to a friend of the couple, Chichester informed John's mother her son had found a job opportunity and moved abroad with Linda. Which was odd, don't you think? However, Chichester himself also disappeared. Meanwhile, Linda's friends and family kept receiving postcards from France. But the very first twist in the tale came in 1994. New owners at the San Marino property were digging a pool in the backyard when they found remains, oh, no. later identified as John's. But what about Linda and Chichester? To answer that, we have to jump forward to 2008. Christian Gerhardt's writer was arrested for kidnapping his daughter and things began to emerge. Ooh. For one, Gerhardt's writer had been passing himself off as a member of the Rockefeller family, and secondly, a fingerprint check also revealed that he was Christopher Chichester. Man. Chichester was subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of John, but unfortunately to date, Linda is still missing. What? At large, Linda at large. Number 8. Guilty, but not quite. Around the same time, in 1989, across the country in Warwick, Rhode Island, 29-year-old Victoria Cushman was found dead inside her apartment. On paper, the case seemed pretty easy to solve. Cushman had been involved in a relationship with a local police officer called Jeffrey Scott Hornoff. When he denied any involvement with the woman, investigators still became very suspicious. However, Officer Hornoff had a pretty solid alibi for that night. Multiple friends reported he was at a party with them on the night of the murder. That footage. Still, the Rhode Island State Police was under pressure. They needed a culprit, and Hornoff was the closest one. The officer was charged in 1994. The following six-week trial of 1996 found him guilty of first-degree murder, murder, sentencing him to life in prison. In 2002, Hornoff was obviously still serving a sentence when, surprise, 45-year-old Todd Barry confessed to the murder of Cushman straight to the Rhode Island Attorney General. What? He claimed he was her boyfriend at the time and ultimately received what? a 30-year sentence. As for Hornoff, he was immediately released and cleared of all wrongdoing, but understandably, he filed a lawsuit for $600,000 to the city of Warwick. Rightly so. No, he deserves more than that. Yeah, more bread. Yeah. Number 7. A family murder taking a few twists. Sugarland, Texas, home of the Whitakers, December 2003. The Ooh, oldest son of recently. Kent and Trisha Whitaker, Bart, came to visit his parents to announce he had finally finished all of his exams at Sam Houston State University. To celebrate, his parents took both of their sons out for dinner. Once they got back home, Bart stayed in the car looking for his missing phone. Kent, Trisha and Kevin, the younger brother, went inside the house and were attacked by an armed robber who killed Kevin and Trisha. Kent, no. wounded, was able to see Bart rushing into the house and getting shot by the killer. However, the police weren't much impressed by Bart's heroic gesture. Why had nothing been stolen? Plus, it was also discovered Bart had already tried to hire one of his friends to kill his family, making oh. it look like a botched robbery. Pretty much the definition of suspicious. Oh. 
Still, he managed to escape to Mexico, where he was arrested two years later to be sentenced to death. He avoided execution at the very last minute thanks to a campaign for his life led by none other than his father. What? Oh. Wait, what? Yeah, that's mental. But man dumping <laughs> up his family and then his dad is like, no, nah, don't kill him. That is outrageous. Number six, the Manson victim who returned from the grave. The story of Charles Manson, his family and their crimes is well known, but not everybody knows the story of one of the cult leader's would-be victims, Bernard Crowe. Crow had the pleasure of meeting Manson a few months before the murders of Sharon Tate and the LaBiancas of 1969. At the time, a member of the family known as Charles Watson, or his nickname Tex, got into a dispute over money with Crow. According to Crow, Tex stole from him, so he threatened to kill everyone at Manson's ranch if Tex didn't give his money back. Tex, man. Now here's something interesting. <laughs> Manson, who's well known for sending other people to do the dirty work, decided to handle the situation by himself. He went to Crow's apartment and shot him in the stomach. And that was it. To Manson, Crow was dead. He even mentioned him among his victims in the sensationalized 1971 trial. Thing is though, Crow was in fact still alive. He had just never gone to the police about the shooting and never retaliated against Manson. No snitching, you rate it. Number five. Wait, that's it. Psychic vision. This is a story that involves a psychic in a crime investigation. Sounds insane, but not that unusual. Let's look at the bigger picture. In 1980, 31-year-old Melanie Aribe from Burbank, California went missing. Only two days after her disappearance, Etta Smith, a clerk at the Lockheed Corporation of Burbank, reached out to the police, claiming she had a vision about Melanie. Smith reported that hearing of the woman's disappearance on the radio triggered a psychic vision in her. She saw Melanie's body in a rural area. Within 45 minutes, the police escorted Smith to Lopez Canyon, where her instincts believed Melanie was hidden. Seems like a nice gesture, but not many saw it that way. Seems a bit weird. Yeah, a bit sus. Yeah. Man. The police believed Smith knew Melanie's whereabouts because she killed her. So they put her in jail for four days before they realised she was indeed innocent. I would have done that. The real killers had been tracked down, and it was determined that Smith had no connection to them. She was just genuinely trying to help. Number four. Oh, man. Uh, so was she actually psychic then? What's going on? No, of course she wasn't, Toby. Well, she uh, might have been. <laughs> bro, this ain't Pokemon, bro. We ain't fucking Alakazam. He's not psychic. <laughs> like, there ain't well, how psychics. does she know then? If there, they ain't find the thing there. there ain't There ain't psychics, bro. There ain't psychics. All that shit is waff. It's a big waff. Number four. Familiar handwriting. Ted Kaczynski, commonly known as Unabomber, needs no introduction. He was a murderous terrorist active throughout the 1980s and early 1990s. He managed to elude law enforcement for about 18 years Fuck until 1995. Well, the 90s were active, you know. Yeah. At the time, he'd sent out his 35,000 word manifesto to American magazines and newspapers like the New York Times and Washington Post. This was his way of explaining his beliefs and theories on how technology was evil and had corrupted society. True. I was say, not wrong. To the point where people should disband the technological system and live in agrarian tribes. Little did he know that with this manifesto, he'd also signed his demise. Literally. Kaczynski's sister-in-law and his brother David saw the published manifesto and recognised the terrorist writing style. They even submitted writing samples to the FBI for analysis, which led the authorities to a match. So on April the 6th, 1996, the police arrested the infamous Unabomber. The following trial sentenced him to life in prison. Good. Number three, what? the killer is not always the husband. Sometimes the wife. <laughs> this story dates back to September 2008 in Sweden. The dead body of 63-year-old Agneta Westland was found near a lake by none other than her husband, Ingemar Westland. This seemed suspicious to the authorities who arrested him and held him in custody for 10 days. However, they found no evidence to tie him to the murder, so he was released. Still, the investigation went on, but the break in the case arrived when Agnita's forensic analysis came back. It reported that the poor woman had been randomly kicked to death by a drunk moose during her evening what? walk. Which Wait, already sounds unreal, on. but how what? was it drunk? Well, according to Swedish Radio International, the animal, which is usually pretty shy, can become aggressive after eating fermented fallen apples. I got waved off That's of the apples. That's truly unlucky. That is outrageous, yeah. Waved off of apples? When is your time? It's your time, bro. No, nah, but hey, man, who, who are you gonna tell? How, oh, how did she die? Oh, she was kicked to death by a moose. Like what? It's a moose just... are massive. They're like the yeah. size of horses. <laughs> They're like West Ham. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's good. That was really good. I got you, Bez. I got you. Oh, my head hurts. I can't laugh. Bro. That was really good. Oh, that was great. That was really good. I appreciate that a lot. Number two, a fake chewing gum survey. 
To find out why the police set up a fake chewing gum survey, we have to start from the beginning. Precisely in 1976, when the police discovered the murdered body of 70-year-old Blanche Kimball in her Augusta apartment. Who murders a 70-year-old? Psychos, bro. Investigators immediately tracked down 27-year-old Gary Robert Wilson, who had stayed at Kimball's home briefly before the murder, but he managed to skip town. Not really a great day for Maine State Police, which found themselves with no prime suspect. The case went cold for decades. But in 2010, there was a turning point in the investigation. Two homeless men got into a fight in Seattle, and one of them, Gary Raub, slashed the other with a knife. Analysis revealed DNA on Raub's knife matched with Gary Robert Wilson. But to be super sure he was Blanche Kimball's killer, the police needed another DNA sample. First, they found Raub wandering the streets. Then, an undercover officer paid him to participate in a fake chewing gum survey, which consisted of testing different flavors of gum. Oh, wow, At that smart. point, the police received and analyzed yeah, the DNA on the gum. The results showed that Raub and Wilson were indeed the same person. The 64-year-old man was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Number 1. A double homicide was actually a weird coincidence. In the summer of 2017, the French police came across a puzzling crime scene in the village of Orthon de Perche. Two friends, Oliver Boudin and Lucien Perrault, hey, stock footage kills me, man. found dead on the porch. The body of Boudin was found lying on his back on the ground, while Perrault was found slumped on a chair at a terrace table. Since it looked like they'd both died around the same time with no signs of robbery or fight, prosecutors assumed they had been poisoned. But that didn't last for long, because after five days of investigation, the mystery was solved. Doctors determined that Lucien had choked on a chunk of beef rib. Olivier, what? who had a pre-existing condition, had a heart attack, presumably from the shock of seeing his friend choke. What a howler. Oh, man. What? what a howler. That's top 10 howlers, bro. That's, that's bad. He's got, he's, eat, he's eating a fucking, he's eating a rib. Don't go TGIs, boys. Get ribs, you fucking. <laughs> that's what you get from that. Don't go TGIs. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. Well, uh, right. Bye.